Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. In today's special episode, we sat down with Dr. Arthur Herman, senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and director of the Quantum Alliance Initiative, to hear his take on the U.S.-China data war and the global race for quantum computing. Let's dive in. Hello, Arthur. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great to have you on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. So a topic of great interest today is the growing concern of how companies collect and use our data. For example, we saw last year the Trump administration signing executive orders to ban TikTok. And now on the flip side, we have China going after Didi, China's version of Uber. Could you explain to us what the concerns are with these companies and why our personal data is so important? I've been writing about in my columns at Forbes.com uh, for a while now um, about the underlying issue for all of this discussion about where we get apps from, who controls those apps on our phone, and about uh, who then is going to have access to the information, the data that flows off of that app. And as we get more and more wired in the world, and as we find our interconnections with businesses, with uh, services like, for example, Didi or Uber, um, and also social media, what we have to understand is, is that all of this generates uh, myriads of data. And the amount of data that is generated and collected uh, electronically and that is available through our uh, digital through our digital connections has grown in, in exponential ways. The numbers are enormous. And as we move into an increasingly advanced wireless world, with the, with the advent of 5G technology, 5G technology, we're going to be looking at an explosion of, of data uh, access that is, I think, very, uh, on the one hand, it's, it's staggering in terms of numbers, but it's also very concerning from, a, from a, a national security and a strategic point of view. Let me explain why. All of this data, uh, seemingly random data, you know, information about on your phone about, for example, making arrangement to pick up your kids at school, right? Who would want to have data like that, right? You would think that foreign powers would be, want to be interested in classified data, highly sensitive data, and of course they are. What's interesting about even that kind of random data is, is that that data, when it's put together with billions and billions of other bits of seemingly random data, is run through a big data analytics program that's constantly looking for patterns uh, lurking in that data that you and I or even any, any sort of trained observer is going to miss out on. And then you attach the power of artificial intelligence and machine learning to that myriad of data, which is trained and learns how to look for patterns of recognition, look for uh, a, a modeling that allows it to give predictions given on past patterns. What you have is a way in which you can turn all these little tiny bits of data into a larger strategic picture, a picture in which what you and what the, the time you arranged on your phone to pick up your kids at school fits into all the data that flows everybody in your city is is connecting with their kids, is connecting with their friends, is connecting with people who work, let's say, in government agencies or is in the military, uh, or that have access to uh, uh, information that comes from that, even if it's non-classified. What can emerge, thanks to the power of artificial intelligence, is a strategic picture in which all of those pieces are like pieces of a gigantic puzzle that suddenly come together in a picture that can be extremely interesting to an intelligence service, uh, to military strategists, to policy analysts in trying to understand uh, patterns of behavior or understand uh, how uh, power is distributed in a hostile antagonist in ways that uh, we have to realize that data has now become the raw material under which, through which, uh, national power is going to be built. And that's why I say that data is becoming the new strategic commodity of the 21st century. 
what oil and gas was in the 20th century, what coal and steel was in the 19th century, the, indis the, the indispensable components of making for national power and strategic advantage over other powers, that's what data is becoming in our age today, Tiffany. So what do you think led to the shift in data becoming the new strategic commodity? Why is user data suddenly so sought after? Well, it, it's two things. One is the the arrival of huge amounts of it from so many different kind different sources. As we, as I said before, as we get wired more and more digitally, and we're exchanging more and more information with more and more people and more services with whom we don't have any other kind of interaction, but which is also has access to the other stuff that's on our phone. That was one of the challenges with DD applications, for example. Is, is that there was a lot of information there that Chinese government was afraid that American intelligence services would be able to get because it would come up people's addresses, information about their jobs and occupations, even facial recognition data, interestingly enough, that would come through that mobile app. And likewise with TikTok, that there was that the TikTok app uh, gives access to data about who your friends are. It gives access to your address, to a lot of other apps on your phone that you may not even be aware of. And it may even be think is perfectly harmless, but which through the magic of artificial intelligence and big data analysis can, can be a means by which an intelligence official, an analyst can learn more about you than you know yourself. That's the power of data and artificial intelligence when you put them together. So what are some of the risks that come with these analysts and governments collecting this data? The risks are that it's not just about who gets access to your data, but what they're going to do with it when they've got it. And one of the ways in which we can prevent this kind of a flow of data uh, to the strategic advantage of another country, particularly an antagonist, which in the case of China with the United States, we have to look upon this as part of the ongoing geopolitical struggle between our two countries now that's going to shape the rest of the 21st century. That, that we have to think about the access to data, not just as a privacy issue, which is, I think, the way most of us think about, you know, I don't want you to know what my kid's, you know, phone number is or know about what time I'm picking it up. And that's a big issue, the privacy issue. But even more important in the larger picture is who has access to that data that they can then use as a way not just to target you. You may not even be factor into their calculations or into their broader strategic picture at all. But it becomes, again, bits of the puzzle that allow them to get a picture of how Americans live, about how Americans act, about the patterns by which we lead our lives that offer opportunities for an intelligence service, for example, to figure out sort of when we meet with people or when we're connecting with someone who is of interest to them. So it all leads, all, all this data allows for bigger and bigger patterns of recognition to emerge and more and more prediction of what we're going to do in our lives and in our activities uh, and, and as well as decisions that even our leaders are going to make are all affected in this in this kind of in this kind of in this kind of way. As a strategic commodity, how can all this data and analysis be used? The more you're able to understand what your opponent's going to do, how they think, how they behave when they get up in the morning and when they go to sleep, what they do on Sundays as opposed to what they do on work days. That's valuable information if you're an intelligence agency or a military planner. You know, it's like the old, it's like the old example, right, about, you know, the butterfly's wing, right, that, that the butterfly's wing can change, you know, the whole patterns of the universe. That's kind of what's happening with data, T Tiffany. Even the smallest amounts of seemingly insignificant data can be part of a larger and even dangerous strategic picture if, if, the person who's using that data, manipulating it, is using it as a way in which to target the United States or our allies 
or to increase their power over their own citizens. And that's part of the that's part of what's happening here too, Tiffany. What we're looking at is is the China utilizing the the artificial intelligence engines that they've used to create this powerful total surveillance state, right? Which controls the lives of their citizens down to the smallest detail. Turning that engine of total control and dominance abroad at, and aiming it at the rest of us as a way in which we, they can begin to develop ways in which to affect and change our behavior in ways that they want. So how far away are we from this happening, from governments utilizing personal information to manipulate or control the populace? Uh, and the Chinese are already doing this, you know, Tiffany. They've already, you, you know, they have a, this... A social credit system for rewarding people who conform to the party, Communist Party's ideals and principles, and who, you know, move in lockstep with the party and punish those who resist or defy those standards and principles uh, or act in ways the party doesn't want them to act. They've already begun to export that social credit system abroad. Um, they've found ways in which to continue co to convince other countries, even companies, private companies, that these are powerful tools in the way in which you can keep track of your employees and make sure that they're working when they should be working, to make sure that they're not goofing off uh, when they're supposed to be at the job, or to make sure that they're not engaging in, you know, dangerous behaviors. And so it can be a powerful tool through big data analytics of keeping track of people's patterns of behavior, but it can also be a powerful means of social control. And what we're seeing is, is that what China has done to its own citizens, it hopes through the magic of big tech and high tech, it's hoping it'll be able to do that to the rest of us as well. That's, that, I think, is the ultimate challenge uh, and the ultimate, ultimate threat that we're going to have to deal with when it comes to who has access to our data and what do they do with it. Just now, you mentioned the implication of social control of a population through user data. You've said here and in your recent op-ed, DD China and the Data War, that data has become the new strategic commodity for global dominance. It seems like most people feel that TikTok is just another social media app where you can get rich and famous overnight. And that is a good trade-off if they can achieve stardom. In other words, a deal with the devil. So if the end goal you touched upon is true, can you expand on that? Sure. Every bit of data is grist for the artificial intelligence mill. It can find ways, by putting it together with the myriads of other data, it can find ways to define patterns of behavior that can be used to not only understand what you're going to do and predict what you're going to do, but ultimately to control what you're going to do. And that's where the Chinese project is headed. We're way behind in this. In some ways, I think it's a good sign that we're not. We are, as a government, uh, that we don't think about the use of technology as a way to control the citizenry. Uh, we're supposed to think about these these great these technologies, the internet and and digital technology, and even artificial intelligence in ways in which to expand our options, to expand our freedoms. Um, but China, you know, tends to look upon other governments the way they think themselves. And so one of the reasons, as I explain in that column for Forbes.com, one of the reasons that China is cracking down on DD and other mobile apps uh, in China is that they fear that the United States is going to do what China is going to do, and that is, is to collect this data, uh, analyze it, run it through the, run it through the, the sieve of big data analytics and artificial intelligence and use it as a way to gain strategic advantage over China. Now, we probably do some of that. Um, and those who do it, the intelligence community are not going to tell us about it uh, for obvious reasons and maybe good reasons too. But, the, but the, the Chinese are, in my opinion, far ahead in systematizing this and understanding how powerful these high-tech tools are in being able to develop patterns for controlling and coercing people to do what they want them to do.
So with China trying to become a leader in the technology and computing field, where do you see this as heading? I have no doubt, Tiffany, that underlying all of this, including their interest in the most advanced computing systems that we can conceive of, namely quantum computers, that what they see in the union of artificial intelligence and quantum computing is the ability to, to develop a really, a, a, if you like, a system of systems, a massive artificial intelligence machine that will be able to generate generate results and transform the way in which we live, the way in which the planet functions through the power, the power of high tech and artificial intelligence. I believe what the Chinese have done with their total surveillance state, their facial recognition systems, social credit and so on, are all building blocks to a much larger, and I, I think we have to say much more sinister plan, which is the way in which Chinese world domination will be fueled by and sustained by high tech in all of its aspects, but particularly the union of artificial intelligence, machine learning, plus quantum computers in the future. And that's why the battle over data is also the battle over the future. So you mentioned quantum computing. Could you explain what that is? How will it work with artificial intelligence and how will these technologies work to shape our future? Quantum computing is something that I've worked on uh, as director of the Quantum Alliance Initiative here at Hudson for, well, almost four years now. Now, I'm not an engineer or a scientist, uh, but I do understand about the scientific principles, the physical principles that underline quantum computing and make it so different from digital computing. And that is, is that what you're doing with uh, quantum computing is you're actually harnessing the energy of nature itself, namely quanta, the small bits of energy that underlie light and that in fact underlie all of the fabric of nature. And you're, you're, you're harnessing those quanta, those bits, subatomic particles, in order to conduct data processing, in order to do computing. Uh, and you're able to gain enormous advantage over the simple digital computing because quanta are nonlinear. Uh, they can assume multiple states at once, whereas your classic digit uh, for a digital computer can be a one or a zero, uh, one or the other, but it can't be both. Uh, a quantum bit, a qubit for a quantum computer can be both one and zero. It can be zero and one. It can be a one or it could be a zero, four different states for one little qubit. What this means, Tiffany, without going into all the scientific technical detail, is that quantum computers will be able to solve mathematical problems um, and issues relating to um, the, the most difficult scientific problems uh, that we face today at a speed which even the fastest supercomputers will be unable to approach. Solving these problems in matters of minutes, they would take a supercomputer tens of thousands of years to solve. And one of those problems, or a set of those problems, are the ones that underlie our public encryption systems, all of which are built on the premise that they rely on mathematical puzzles that are so long and so complicated that no digital computer can solve them, that it takes forever. That's what makes the information safe. If it's encrypted in ways that no computer can figure out, you know, how, how is, what's the encryption? I don't understand what the secret is. You're in good shape until now. With a quantum computer, those encryption systems will be broken down in a matter of minutes. And that's why the Chinese are working as fast as they can to develop quantum computer uh, proficiency. That's why we are as well at our national security agency and in the big computer companies that are involved in quantum computing enterprise like IBM, and Intel, and Microsoft, and Google. Everybody understands what the stakes involved are. The exponential leap in terms of processing power and the ability to solve these kinds of problems, including decrypt and every public encryption system that we know today that's in place today, will make these powerful, even decisive, strategic tools 
and the way in which they'll be able to accelerate artificial intelligence's ability to make sense of and develop patterns of understanding of present and future behavior uh, uh, through analysis of data will increase exponentially as well. That they'll be able to sort more and more data faster and faster. So the move towards total control systems based on the ability to use data to put together patterns that allow us to get control over our own citizens and then citizens of other countries will expand fa even faster as well. So quantum computing, artificial intelligence, these are the building blocks by which data will be turned from a raw material, which is kind of is now, into a real strategic commodity. As, as valuable as gold, maybe even more valuable because of the way in which it will allow a country like China to direct the lives and destinies of others for the foreseeable future. So right now on the world stage, who is leading in terms of quantum computing? What are we doing to develop in the field of quantum computing? Well, right now I would say it's a head-to-head -head contest between China and the United States. I would say right now, thanks to the investment and the expertise that our biggest tech companies uh, have been able to bring to bear in the quantum area, um, what we've seen is IBM, what we've seen is these companies have been able to press ahead in the area of quantum computing, building more and more reliable, usable quantum computers that'll begin to move towards the kind of breakthroughs that I've been talking about um, within the next decade, certainly. Um, in the United States, the private sector has taken a big lead. The Chinese, however, are moving fast to catch up, and they've invested enormous sums of money, at least 10 times more than our government has done so far, into developing quantum computing and quantum technologies. Because there's also a flip side to this, Tiffany. In addition to quantum computing and quantum technology being able to decrypt our encryption, existing encryption systems, you can also use quantum technology and the links between those subatomic particles in a quantum state to encrypt data in ways that will be completely unhackable. It's the ultimate solution to our problems about how do I protect my data, how do I make it impossible for anyone except me and who I want to read it, to read it. It's through quantum technology. So how is the Chinese Communist Party doing in the research of quantum technology? Should we be worried in any area? The field of quantum communications is definitely one. That's an area in which the Chinese have taken some big steps forward here in developing quantum communications links that are unhackable and at the same time will be usable as a means by which to communicate sensitive data and, and classified information at the same time. Um, both of these are emerging technologies, unlike artificial intelligence, which is here and now and is just gonna continue to develop and become more sophisticated. These are both still emerging technologies. We haven't gotten to the point yet uh, in which we can use a quantum computer to decrypt, you know, your 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 bank's encryption systems, or crack into the Federal Reserve. At the Hudson, by the way, at the Quantum Alliance Initiative, we're doing a study right now of what would happen, what would be the costs involved if quantum computers could decrypt the the systems, the, the security systems that protect our financial markets, our Federal Reserve, our power grid and energy grid, another area in which uh, the vulnerability to quantum computer attack is enormous. It's already vulnerable to classic to attack right now by hackers, we've learned that. But the way in which quantum computers would be able to decrypt and would be able to manipulate the power grid and energy grid in ways we couldn't really understand and couldn't, couldn't realize until it's too late. Um, those are num frightening numbers to look at and data that will help us to understand how important, how grave this situation is.
Are there other countries who are also studying quantum technology, and how will they play into this? There are many countries working on quantum technology, including quantum communications, the establishment of hack-proof networks. Uh, the European Union is very much involved in that. Uh, Great Britain is. Um, the Japan. Uh, we've hosted conferences here at Hudson with Japan on, on, on quantum cooperation in all of these areas. But there's no doubt that the two countries for whom this represents the most important strategic advantage in the geopolitical struggle for the, for the future are the United States and China. And if we allow China to catch up or even take the lead in this area, there's going to be real trouble. And that's, a, that's something that we simply cannot, in my opinion, we cannot allow to happen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Arthur. Great to have you on the show. It's a great pleasure. And for those just tuning in, that was today's special episode with Dr. Arthur Herman, Senior Fellow at the Hudson Institute and Director of the Quantum Alliance Initiative. Thanks for watching and see you next time.